Yeah, I've disagreed. Okay, you can go ahead and start us off. Okay, I think I'm live. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, everybody? Thanks very much. Uh, that's wonderful. So um, I'd like to welcome you to our Zoom event. And welcome to the Hank Center's fall 2021 season. Pardon me if I have some emails if I should have had that closed and I will close it. So um, everybody welcome. We begin our proceedings this academic year with another in our popular conversations on the Catholic imagination series. And you'd be hard pressed to find a more appropriate subject for the series than Dante. Uh, who quite literally wrote the book on the Catholic imagination, not least because he lived it and was marked to his heart, in his heart, by it. Dante was engraced by the Catholic imagination in all of its beauty, mystery, and complication. And to riff on Hopkins, Dante's graces have helped to keep grace, helped to keep our goings graces hmm. in God, in whom we live, move, and have our very being. And so welcome one and all to why, to why Dante Matters today, and we're glad you're all here. My name is Michael Murphy, and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola. On behalf of university okay. leadership, okay. and on behalf of Joan and Bill Hank, okay. whose generous right. endowment yeah. funds our many enterprises, I extend a hearty greeting. We at the Hank Center are celebrating our 15th anniversary this year, and so are more profoundly mindful about the kind of commitment it takes to make a center like ours go, uh, from vision to endowment to cultivating friendships. Um, it has been so enlightening for me to look back and see how things took shape, are taking shape, and all the good things so many have done in the name of the Hank Center and the Catholic intellectual, political, artistic, social tradition. Uh, so we're making it a, a, a year of Thanksgiving for Joan and Bill and all the Hank family. A year of Thanksgiving, quite honestly, for the living fruits of the Catholic intellectual heritage uh, that really still move our, our hearts and minds today more uh, essential, the very method, the very content of such a movement. In this spirit, I also offer a warm welcome from our dedicated center staff, our new office manager, Patty Delgado, and our new graduate student assistant, Adam High, and our comm team led by Sam Surich. I'm so grateful for your, your, superb, uh, your superb work and really welcome aboard. Um, so really a round of applause for you. And now Dante Alighieri, the very name gives us cause to pause. His prophetic voice, his humanity, his technical vitality, innovative spirit, his love for the true, the good and the beautiful, his love of learning, his desire for God. Sure. While Dante was treated so poorly by Pope Boniface VIII, subsequent popes have laid down a litany of mea culpas, canticles of atonement from the chair of Peter's, but more celebrations of Dante. In his recent apostolic letter, Candor Lucius Eterne, promulgated on the Feast of the Annunciation just last spring, Pope Francis celebrates well the unique virtuosity of Dante as poet, pilgrim, and expert in humanity calling Dante a, quote, prophet of hope and, quote, the poet of mercy. Pope Francis has declared a Dante year in the church, marking the seventh centenary of the poet's death, September 14th, 1321. So more on that from our experts momentarily. Quick housekeeping. Thanks very much for putting eyes on our next two events. A September 7th event, um, excuse me, a September 22nd event on racial justice in the world's religions, and an October 7th event on Unguarded, a film by Loyola uh, uh, alum, TJ Burden, and his colleague, Simonetta Italia Wiener, about APOC, the revolutionary Brazilian prison system centered on the full recovery and rehabilitation of the person. Please be our guest, and it hits me right here that that's a really appropriate uh, topic for a panel on Dante as well. Uh, incarceration and prison reform. 
So a note on our Zoom format, it's a meeting today. Most people on the call, uh, have, we've all been through this. Uh, the chat is closed, except you can uh, send your questions and comments right to me, Michael Murphy. And as always, I do my best to integrate them, uh, and I will do. So please, um, write as we go. Uh, if this event were in person, we'd be selling books in the corner. Uh, our authors are prolific. And please check the chat for links to their books. They're coming in right now. Um, all on the call have new work, and that includes Father Greg's dissertation. Uh, and of course, Randy's Dante's Indiana just dropped, as the kids say, yesterday. So then let's welcome our speakers briefly so we can get going. You're in for a treat as our panelists are so continually and authentically moved by Dante every day. Uh, in their own work, in their own lives. They show the range of the poet's inspiration. Longer bios are available on the Hank Center webpage, so please uh, go there for more. Uh, first, Angela Alima O'Donnell is the Associate Director of Fordham University's Kern Center for American Catholic Studies and teaches courses in English and in American Catholic Studies. Three recent books to highlight, two collections of poems, Love in the Time of Coronavirus, which came out just last month, and Andalusian Hours, a collection of 101 sonnets that channel the voice of the great Flannery O'Connor from Paraclete Press last spring. Also, Angela's excellent study of race in the writings of Flannery O'Connor from Fordham Press, Radical Ambivalence, Race in Flannery O'Connor, also from 2020. <laughs> Excuse me. Welcome, Angela. Uh, Randy Boyagoda uh, is the author of three novels. Original Prin was named a Globe and Mail Best Book of 2018 and is the first of a planned trilogy. The second in this trilogy is titled Dante's Indiana, a text from which Randy will read in short order. Randy is principal and vice president of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto where he is also professor of English and holds the Basilian Chair in Christianity, Arts, and Letters. A former president of Penn Canada, Randy also writes for numerous publications, including the New York Times, Guardian, and America Magazine. Welcome, Randy. Father Stephen A. Gregg is a monk of the Cistercian Abbey of Our Lady of Dallas in Texas. After undergraduate studies in classics and in medieval studies at the University of the South, Swanee, uh, he entered the Cistercian Monastery in 2006. Uh, Father Stephen completed a, a licentiate in patristic theology at the Patristic Institute Augustinianum in Rome and is now a doctoral candidate in the Institute of Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas. His dissertation is on divine love and beauty in the poetry of Edmund Spencer. Can't wait to read that. Paul Mariani. An award-winning poet, biographer, and critic is the author of 20 books, including eight volumes of poetry and biographies of Robert Lowell, John Berryman, Hart Crane, Gerard Manley Hopkins, William Carlos Williams, and Wallace Stevens. His honors include fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. He is the Emeritus University Professor at Boston College and lives in Western Massachusetts with his wife, Eileen. His most recent books are The Mystery of It All, The Vocation of Poetry in the Twilight of Modernity, that's from Paraclete, and Ordinary Time, Poems out of Greg Wolf's Great Press, Slant Books. So that's a lot to take in and we have a lot more for you. Let's get to it with a warm welcome and to hand it over to Father Greg, and let's watch how this thing unfolds, why Dante matters today. I'm going to begin uh, reading from Canto Three of the Inferno, but this will be in the original language. Per me si va nella città dolente, per me si va nell'eterno dolore, Per me si va tra la perduta gente. Giustizia mosse il mio alto fattore. Fecemi la divina podestate, la somma sapienza e il primo amore. Dinanzi a me non fuor cose create se non eterne, e io eterno duro. 
lasciate ogni speranza voi che entrate. Queste parole di colore oscuro vi dio scritte al sommo d'una porta, perché io, maestro, il senso lor me duro, ed elli a me come persona accorta. Qui si convien lasciare ogni sospetto, ogni viltà convien che qui sia morta. Noi siamo venuti al loco, ho vitto detto che tu vedrai le genti dolorose che hanno perduto il ben dell'intelletto. E poi che la sua mano alla mia puose con lieto volto, ond'io mi confortai, mi mise dentro alle secrete cose. Qui vi sospiri, pianti e alti guai risonavan per l'aere senza stelle, perché io al cominciar ne lagrimai. Diverse lingue, orribili favelle, parole di dolore, accenti d'ira, voci alte e fioche, e suon di man con elle facevano un tumulto, il qual s'aggira sempre in quell'aura senza tempo tinta, come l'arena quando turbo spira. Grazie, Father Stephen. <laughs> This is the English translation by uh, Robert and Jean Hollander. Uh, the first nine lines are the words inscribed above hell, uh, and then Dante takes over. Through me, the way to the city of woe. Through me, the way to everlasting pain. Through me, the way among the lost. Justice moved my maker on high. Divine power made me wisdom supreme and primal love. Before me, nothing was but things eternal, and eternal I endure. Abandon all hope, you who enter here. These words, dark in hue, I saw inscribed over an archway. And then I said, Master, for me, their meaning is hard. And he, as one who understood, here you must banish all distrust. Here must all cowardice be slain. We have come to where I said you would see the miserable sinners who have lost the good of intellect. And after he had put his hand on mine with a reassuring look that gave me comfort, he led me toward things unknown to man. Now sighs, loud wailing, lamentation resounded through the starless air so that I too began to weep. Unfamiliar tongues, horrendous accents, words of suffering, cries of rage, voices loud and faint, the sound of slapping hands. All these made a tumult, always whirling in that black and timeless air as sand is swirled in a whirlwind. Hi, everyone. This is Randy Boyagoda, and uh, I'm very glad to be with you this evening and to read to you from my new novel, Dante's Indiana. I'll say a little bit more about the novel as part of our larger conversation. It's clearly in response to, uh, to the work of, um, of the Divine Comedy. I'll just begin by offering a very quick sense of the situation and what I'll be reading to you from today. The novel is about a group of people building a Dante theme park in an opioid ravaged small town in the middle of America. The main character is uh, a middle-aged bike riding Sri Lankan Catholic English professor from Toronto named Prin. He's lost his job, his wife and children have moved away, he's fallen away from his relationship with God, he's looking for a way out and he accepts an unexpected invitation to help an evangelical millionaire build a Dante theme park in the middle of Terre Haute, Indiana. He goes there and begins working with others. And what I'm gonna to read to you from right now is an effort that Prin, with two of the people involved in building the theme park, Frank and Nick, take. They're going to an abandoned theme park outside town to find some ideas and inspiration for their own theme park. But as we all know from Dante, 
Uh, people can say one thing, but they really might be thinking or doing or worried about something else. This is from Dante's Indiana. Are you sure this place is open? I said. There's cars in the parking lot, said Nick. There's people in the parking lot, said Frank. And what's the plan again, I said. The plan is we'll walk through and figure out if there's anything, ideas or even models, at least for the main rides, like those spinning teacups for doomed lovers, right, Prin? Yes, Paolo and Francesca, forever whirling around each other. See? So yeah, stuff we could use for the park. Then Prin brings it back to the professors and gets them on board, and either we send it to the consultants or we tender it ourselves. Okay, guys? Nick and I nodded at Frank. There were maybe a dozen vehicles in the gravel parking lot. Rusted up family vans and cars with garbage bags blocking the rear windows. At opposite ends were a BMW 323 and a Chrysler 500. Both were black, with tinted windows and fat, meg-hearted wheels. Their engines were on, music was on, and their front windows went up and down for each rag and bone visitor. There were so many of them. It was hard to think that even in this little parking lot in a little town in Indiana, it had undone so many of them. We parked away from the other cars and walked to the park entrance. The security guard was sleeping. Three women approached us. The first had stringy hair. The second had almost no hair. The third had serpentine dreadlocks. All were pockmarked and scratching their chests. We kept walking. The women back followed for a few steps and turned back. Others came up and backed away, surprised that we were real and here. Dizzy's world was open. Beyond the snack bar, the park was a broad spread of asphalt broken up by rusty kitty rides, vacant concession stands, and empty game stalls. One summer, I won a Walkman for my daughter, right there. We went to Arby's to celebrate. Megan loved Arby's, loves. We were right there, said Frank. Does your daughter live in town? I said. Let's keep walking, said Frank. It felt like we were walking through the ghost of an amusement park. We came to the center, a massive plastic and metal elm tree attached to an industrial sized winch. Above the tree's fudge brown limbs and trunk, peekaboo windows were cut into the metallic greenery. There was a small arched door in the middle of the trunk. The door was closed. The twirling elm tree, said Nick. Yeah, said Frank. I could spend all day in there back when we used to come as kids and it was perfect. I used to think that's what it was like to be kind of like God, sitting still above it all in one of the windows with everyone looking up, trying to find you, knowing you're there and smiling when they see you and you smiling down at them and watching the whole world circling around you. Is there something like that in Dante Prin? said Nick. The door opened, head first, body part by body part. A young man crawled out, his chin dragging on the ground. Feet first on her belly, a woman slid out after him. They were skinny enough to fit through the child size entrance. They looked at us sleepily, then walked away slowly. After a while, two little boys also came out of the tree. They followed their parents, the bigger one holding onto the smaller one by his backpack. I really don't think this is a place for us, I said. Just keep walking. It's not the place for those kids either, but they're here. People's kids are here. Frank was already walking ahead straight towards the park's main ride a small wooden roller coaster. It was old, but it didn't look broken down like everything else. A cutout wooden knight held a sword sideways beside the entry gate, indicating how tall you had to be to ride the dragon. There wasn't much to it as far as roller coasters go. The ride wouldn't take more than a minute. It had a dragon face and the rest, was rest of the cars were patterned in electric green scales. Actually, that's perfect, I said. For what, said Nick. In the middle of Inferno, Dante and Virgil are stuck because they can't go any further on foot. They're surrounded by rivers of blood and deserts of fire. So they take a ride on this human-faced monster. I don't remember its name, but it's kind of like a giant scorpion or snake. So far, all the other professors have done to translate that part of the poem for the theme park is to suggest painting the monster's body between two levels and have people walk down the arena ramp. That's so boring, said Nick. I don't even understand 90% of what's going on in Dante, even after the PowerPoint version you had them put together for us, Prin. But even I can see something scary and fun in a roller coaster that looks like a monster. 
Who wants to walk when you can roll? Right, Frank? Yeah, sure, that could work, said Frank. He was texting and looking around, scanning, searching. Frank, you're worse than a middle schooler with that phone. Sorry, my wife keeps texting me. Frank, could you take a few shots for us? I just need to talk to Frank about something. I took his phone and went around the roller coaster, then along the platform taking pictures. Every few I looked back at Frank and Nick, two 60-year-old men in dockers and hard-toed shoes, arguing. Nick hugged Frank, who didn't hug him back. They agreed. Nick announced they agreed. There was nothing else for them to see in the park. The passenger side window of Frank's truck was shattered. The glove box was open. Papers were strewn on the floor mats. The highway transponder and garage door opener were gone, as was the backrest on the driver's seat and the charger cable and dashboard mount for Frank's phone. The navigation screen was cracked and its metal lining scuffed and dented. Someone had to try to prise it out of the console with the bent blackened spoon that was sitting on the driver's seat. There were tins of Pringles dumped out and thrown aside. Pringles all the way down. We looked around. The same cars were there in the parking lot, the same cragged, wandering people. And a few were now watching us. The Arby's coupons! The Arby's coupons! said Frank. What? They're gone! Look down there! No, I'm serious. Come here and look down there. Look! My Burger King coupons are still there, my Jimmy John's, my Pot Bellies, my Domino's. But the Arby's coupons are gone, Nick! Gone! Frank stepped away from the truck. His face was red and lit up, and his eyes were big and glassy like he was about to cry and just won the lottery and might stab someone. He kept opening and closing his hands, clutching air. He turned to look at the crowd in the parking lot and began running. Megan, Megan, where's Megan? Which one of you knows where Megan is? I'll give you money if you tell me where Megan is. Where's Megan? Who knows Megan? We followed. By the time we reached Frank, he had taken out his wallet. Suddenly, everyone knew Megan. Nick told him to get away and press down on Frank's hands to make him put his wallet back in his pocket. Most of the people wandered off, mouths agape. Two remained, skinny and scraggly, windbreakers in dirty jeans, sunken faced and sad eyed, fidgety and gumming their raw red faces. She's here, Nick, it makes sense. The Arby's, the Walkman, it makes sense. When I used to drive Megan to the clinic for her methadone, we'd go to Arby's afterwards. That was the treat and it was working. Damn it, it almost worked. She has to be here. One of the men fell into Frank, reaching for his wallet. Nick went to push him away as the other one started patting his own pockets. Looking for what? I saw a silver blade catch light. Knife, I said. Where? Frank, watch out, said Nick. The BMW honked hard and long and everyone stopped and looked. The door opened and the music inside stopped and a very young man stepped out. He might have been 16. The Chrysler 500 drove up beside his car. End this shit. End it right the fuck now, he said. The first one let go of Frank and the other one put away a spoon and they ran off a few feet and stopped and turned back and did it again. This is a quiet and peaceful place for quiet and peaceful people. You are all fucking that up. You two motherfuckers standing over there. One more time and you are banned from my parking lot. Understood? But they had already wandered away. As for you, super dads or whatever the fuck, you're going to get fucked up any second now by one of these people and then the police will come and that's not happening in my fucking parking lot. That is not happening. It is time to go. It is time to go. And you are never coming back here. It is time to go and you better go or my boy in this car beside me is going to make you go. Do you know Megan? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Father Stephen Gregg, Angela, Alamo O'Donnell, and then Randy Boyagoda. You know, we, we just wanted to get going with the art and uh, we had uh, early 14th century poetry, Dante, in that, is it low Tuscan, Father Greg? I forget what the actual, basically, uh, Angela followed up with a great trans, uh, with reading from the Hollanders, right? We have a question about, you know, what's your favorite Dante translation? Keep that in mind, people. There's a lot of them. You got Longfellow, you got John Chiardi, you got a lot of people to think about here. Dorothy Sayers, is that right? And then Randy, reading from his new book, <clears throat> where you get Arby's and Methadone <clears throat> and PowerPoint. So art always responds to art. It's something that we always talk about. Quick lightning round, guests. How do you think about how that all fit together? Real quick, any thoughts on that? Angela, you're nodding your head. What do you think? 
oh, the descriptions are just so Dante-esque, <laughs> especially those wandering, craggy, um, aimless people, um, the, the, their brokenness, their pockmarked faces, their serpentine hair, um, just all of it is, you know, this is a hellscape, obviously, that these people are wandering through, and uh, the description is just so evocative um, and very much in the spirit of Dante, so there are a lot of things I enjoyed about that, um, uh, that excerpt, but that was one of the things I enjoyed the most. Yeah, thank you. Fox Demon. Yeah, I was thinking what would come, I mean, a wonderful passage. And when I think of hell, uh, amusement parks and Arby's are pretty close in my mind, I think for, uh, the, you know, there's a lot of things in the modern world that seem to us like lifeless, and <laughs> frightening. But what I loved, uh, that urgency to move that comes up several times in the passage you read, you know, like w the question whether we should stay here. Uh, the guy kicking him out at the end, or we, this is not the place for us, you know? And that's a lot of what, um, you know, Virgil, of course, he doesn't exactly have to drag Dante through hell, but, but does have to make sure he doesn't get stuck there, right? This is just, we're just here to look at stuff. We're not here to stay. We don't belong here. Um, and so the, that sort of insistent questioning about the, the daughter, Right, sort of in the back. There's this other story in the background of of the of what of the hell that they're looking at. I thought um, it seems to me a lot like, I mean, in a way, much more vivid um, and uh, and real experience than what Dante is, I think, trying to do. But he's just sort of first trying it, and in a way, you succeed uh, beyond maybe his ability to do because he's got so many other concerns going on. So that was really that's really fascinating. Uh, Mike, I, I think Father Stephen just suggested that I just somehow exceeded Dante. I think I'm going to yeah. formally retire as a novelist. <laughs> I, think I think I'm all good for the rest of my writing career now. Thank you. Yeah. Always leave on a high note, Randy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Paul Mariani, do you have anything to say about your experience of listening to these things? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it just uh, abandon all hope, you who enter the, uh, the uh, subways in New York City, for example. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's just this, uh, uh, the, the nightmare uh, around us uh, and the dreams that we have and the, the, the interchange between Dante's Florence and Italy in the, uh, in the 14th century and in our own time, uh, Kabul, uh, uh, Stalingrad, it, it, just, uh, it just goes on and on. Uh, it, it, it's a nightmare and you want to escape it in any way that you, you possibly can. So I, I'm crawling my way up to uh, toward the purgatory, at least, to get out of this, this hell. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, oh, that's great. You know, or that's, it's, it's true. Is it great because it's true? I mean, I resonate. Let's stick there. So, uh, uh, cherished guests, it's about a half an hour now. We have our four speakers. They're going to laser in on some, some thoughts. Why Dante matters today. Now, we're going to begin with the great Paul Mariani. So, Paul, when you're ready. Yeah, here we go. I'm going to be talking about uh, how deeply Dante goes back for me because my, my mentor, my dear friend, was Alan Mandelbaum, uh, who, of course, is the translator of, uh, of Dante and Virgil and Ovid uh, and, and uh, Homer. Here's, here we go. Back in the fall of 1964, I was blessed to be one of Alan Mandelbaum's first students at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Our graduate director, Helene Newstead, had told me it would be well worth my time to take his seminar in Dante. What I couldn't know at this time was that decision would be a life changer. Back then, he was busy translating Dante and the course turned out to be so dense and multi-layered that it could cover only the Inferno and the Purgatorio. He had an Elan about him, a certain continental flair. And for me, he seemed to know everything. Obviously, he knew and spoke Italian fluently, but he would throw in some Provençal or French or Spanish or Harlem jive talk just for the hell of it. One moment it was Malame, the next it was Baudelaire, the next Virgil in Latin or Homer in Greek. 
or something in Yiddish or Hebrew, or Ungareti, Quisimodo, Montale, or Judici, each of whom he had translated. He was a natty dresser in the European fashion and always seemed to don a beret and smoking along with a long cigarette holder in his right hand. He was tall, thin, lightly bearded, full of nervous energy and always, always thinking. Of all my dancing masters I wrote 40 years ago, the most difficult to follow was Alan. Well, he could dance a step so intricate, so convoluted. My poor feet kept tripping one over the other, trying to keep up. Dante's line splits into Baudelaire's preoccupation with the polis and Malamé's narcissistic self-dismay. So we might begin. And I'd go tripping foot over foot, following first the one step, then the other, spinning home from his class at Hunter late at night on the swaying IRT, dizzy still with so much dancing. And there's Alan up at Lago di Como in 1975, busy at his translation of the Purgatorio at the time, and his explanation that he would have to put Dante aside for a while and immerse himself in the Aeneid, composed 1300 years before by Dante's guide, Virgil. I think I understand why he had to do it this way. Virgil serves as Dante's guide through the way of the, of the lost and the way of the penitent, something we all share before we can attempt to ascend to the circles of the blessed via Beatrice, Aquinas, Francis, and Dominic. I recall one evening in Alan's Dante seminar when he read Dante's passages from Arnaud Daniel in the original Provençal and then read a passage from a new translation of Thomas Aquinas by the Blackfriars begun in the 1960s, a project that would eventually run to 61 volumes. It was the Latin text of the Summa on the left and the English translation on the right. Of course, Alan could read both. And if any poet might grasp that necessary sense of deep humanity, especially in an age like the present of the truly abominable, those 1960s, that poet was Dante's guide, Virgil. Then Alan returned to the Commedia. His translation of the Inferno appeared in 1980, followed by the Purgatorio in 1981 and the Paradiso in 1982. And following that, Alan served as the general editor of the California Lectora Dantis, a collection of in-depth and fascinating essays on the comedy. The Canto by Canto commentary of the Inferno appeared in 1998, followed 10 years later by his commentary in the Purgatorio, by which time Alan was 82. But by then, age and illness had forced their way in so that the commentary in the Paradiso remains in its own limbo. But it's his translation of the Divine Comedy that stands out as his major achievement, a highly readable, vigorous rendition of Dante's epic as one critic phrased it. Here's Alan's uh, entry into hell. Here's sighs and lamentations and loud cries were echoing across the starless air so that as soon as I set out, I wept. Those lines still strike me as I watch the news each night on TV. Think Kabul or further back, Saigon in 1975 or the frozen bodies in Stalingrad in 1942 or the chosen reservoir in 1950 or the gulags in Siberia. Here is Dante rendered as Robert Fagels, a brilliant translator tells us, with clarity, eloquence, terror, and profoundly moving depths. I can still see Alan gazing intently into the bronze eyes of Ovid there in Sulmona in the Abruzzi Highlands. Ovid, 
the poet whose metamorphoses he would masterfully translate 18 years on, but only after first translating Homer's Odyssey three years before that. The man never rested. For the end, I could hear his voice weakening on the phone, even as he still called me his bubula. He officially retired when he was 82 and died three years later in 2011 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The accolades were many. But let Alan have the last word. Here's his rendering of Dante as he realizes that he is and will remain in exile from his beloved Florence, much like Aeneas remembering a city that is no more. You shall leave everything you love most dearly. This is the arrow that the bow of exile shoots first. You ought to know the bitter taste of others' bread, how salt it is, and know how hard a path it is for one who goes descending and ascending other stairs. And then there's that haunting close to the Paradiso, which echoes something of what Alan was also searching for. And with it, the realization as with all of us of the failure of words to capture what we think in the blink of an eye. Something there, something intuited before it too vanishes. I wish to see the way in which our human effigy suited the circle and found place in it, the poet writes. And my own wings were far too weak for that. But then Dante sighs as Alan sighs as well, as I do too, all these years on. My mind was struck by light that flashed and with this light received what it had asked. Here, force failed my high fantasy, but my desire and will were moved already like a wheel revolving uniformly by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. I don't know how possible it is to feel warmth through a computer screen in these crazy Brady Bunch squares, but I know that if we were in person, we would have a, we'd have a feeling. I'm having one now. And so thank you, Paul Mariani, for your masterly work. We speak the name Alan Mandelbaum with honor and we remember him well, a blessed memory here. Thank you. Angela, please take us away. Thank you, and amen, Paul. What a beautiful tribute to your former teacher, mentor, uh, and great genius who has given us such a great gift in his translation of the Commedia. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to actually address Dante's importance to us uh, as a poet rather than as a professor or a scholar for a few minutes. The poet T.S. Eliot once famously stated, Dante and Shakespeare divide the world between them. There is no third. I think all of us poets agree with that. When we sit down to write, the poet who is most likely to be looking over our shoulder is Dante. Like the singular magnificent Gothic cathedral of a poem that he wrote, Dante cannot be ignored. His long shadow falls across the page. He is the elephant poet in the room. This summer, in honor of the 700th anniversary of Dante's death, I decided to embrace that fact. I committed myself to reading a canto of the Commedia each morning. Since there are exactly 100 cantos and there are very nearly 100 days of summer, give or take a few, and since the Commedia is divided into three sections in much the way the summer is divided into three months, this seemed a downright poetic way to spend the summer and to honor Dante. It was, as everyone knows who reads Dante, an intense experience walking with Dante each morning. I found myself drawn into the world of the poem and I would find myself thinking about it for much of the day. He also began entering my dreams. The Commedia is the kind of poem that gets under your skin and won't leave you alone. Dante became a ghost haunting my house. Given his daily presence, I should not have been surprised when I began talking to Dante. 
and that talking took the form of poems. What began as passive reading gradually morphed into a species of accompaniment. I began to write poems in response to the scenarios and the events that Dante reveals to me. At times, the poems would embellish on those scenarios. At others, they would interrogate them. In each case, the poems gave me the opportunity to place myself in the Commedia, to serve as Dante to Dante's Virgil, and to deepen my understanding of this powerful and brilliant poem. I confess, at first this felt presumptuous, setting my little poems beside Dante's great big one, but I enjoyed the conversation and the sense of intimacy with Dante so much that I ignored those naysaying voices that every writer is familiar with and just kept on writing. By the end of the summer, I had written 25 poems, though more are inevitably on their way. Most are formal poems, some of them sonnets, and some written in Dante's Terza Rima to honor the master's craft. Great art generates more art, uh, as Michael referred to earlier. That's a fact that we know to be true. It stimulates the imagination. It calls out the artist and the reader to participate in the experience of the poem to engage in an act of co-creation. That's what these poems are, acts of co-creation, and also recreation, situating the events of Dante's medieval world in the context of our modern one, and thereby exploring what sets us apart as well as what binds us together. And finally, my poems are meant to be celebrations of the fact that the Commedia is a living work of genius, not some dead artifact or dusty museum piece frozen in time. The Commedia is alive and living things produce other living things. So given this, I hope that my own poems might prove to have some life in them. Uh, so I think I'll read a few poems uh, from the project uh, and I'll start with um, the first one, which is a, a, a little letter to Dante. Uh, it's called, it's uh, addressed, Dear Dante. The project, by the way, is called, I, 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 I keep going back and forth between a Dante a day, because that's what I was basically doing, reading a Dante a day, or talking back to Dante. Um, uh, maybe that's just a subtitle. Um, but the first uh, poem has an epigraph, not from the Inferno, but actually from the great translator of Dante, John Ciardi, great Italian-American poet as well, who once wrote, a poem ought to be free to lie its way to the truth. Uh, and this is a sonnet. Dear Dante, all poets are liars. St. Thomas said so. Yet you choose verse to tell the truth. We glide along on your easy tears of Rima, each line, each hanging rhyme, pulling us into deeper, more dangerous waters. You can't look away, and neither can we, from the suffering shades, the pure agony of unchanging pain for eternity. No respite from the minds and the body's fire. If you hated your kind, you could not dream a worse world than your endless hell. A liar's pandemonium, no loving words can soothe. Lured by your language, we blindly follow you. Pray none of the things you write come true. Um, another thing that I did was occasionally place myself or find myself, unfortunately, in some of the uh, cantos of the Inferno. Uh, and one of them was uh, in the Inferno, in, in the canto, um, canto 12, in which people who um, are afflicted with the sin of wrath find themselves. Uh, this is called Swimming with Dante, uh, and the epigraph comes from Inferno 12, uh, lines 46 to 48 and 100 to 102. But fix your eyes below, for we draw near the river of blood that scalds those who by violence do injury to others, Virgil says. And with this trusty escort, we went on, skirting the edge of the vermilion boil from which the boiled cried out with piercing shrieks. I know this river, the river of rage, have stepped in it a time or two and more, have felt it burn my souls, left the shore of sanity and love to wade its waters, immerse myself in wrongs I could not right, conjure violent wars I could not fight, Boil a while in blood, my own and others. Anger is a pleasure. Anger is a cage that holds the soul in bondage to its whim. 
Once you've wandered in, all the brimstone in hell can't save you. No centaur will rescue you like lucky Dante. Forever caught between desire and desire, you swim until the madness leaves you again. Uh, another thing that struck me upon this rereading of Dante, um, and it's just such a beautiful part of the poem, is Dante's compassion. He spends so much of the Commedia weeping. He's a hot mess for, for so much of this poem because even though he knows the justice that God meets out is, is just and, and deserved punishment, he can't help but feel love uh, and compassion for the human beings that he sees suffering. Uh, and one of the most troubling um, episodes in the Inferno for us, I think, is the episode in which we find the suicides. Uh, and so this little sonnet attempts to deal with the complexity of that moment for Dante and for us. Uh, it's, it's a sonnet and it's also a mono rhyme. Each line ends with the same rhyme. This is from Inferno 13. The poet, Virgil, waited and then he said to me, since he is silent now, do not waste time, but speak if you would ask him more. And I replied, please question him about the things you think I need to know, for I cannot. Such pity fills my heart. The forest of suicides, the darkest place for Dante and for us. The tortured, faceless, their bodies are not theirs. No saving grace allows them to reclaim themselves. They are erased forever, their flesh become dead wood, disgraced for a moment's mortal error. No place for mercy in their maker's mind, so base is this act in God's eyes. And yet, encased in Dante's chest is a heart like ours, birthplace of love for the sinner in the face of sin. He's learning that life is a race none of us can win. We're all in last place. Some of us fall, can't keep the killer pace. Perfection is a dream, a heartless chase. Um, and then I'll close with a poem um, that is uh, about Virgil. Uh, we were talking earlier before we started about Virgil and what a touching character he is, his goodness, his faithfulness, his gratuitous love for Dante, who is just a strange guy from Florence <laughs> that he is, has to guide through hell and through purgatory. Um, so this is one of several poems that are a tribute to Virgil um, and also to his sad fate of having to spend eternity in limbo. And this poem is in Dante's Terza Rima. Uh, Virgil is explaining in the Purgatorio to listeners where it is that he comes from. He says, through all the circles of the grieving kingdom have I come here, a power from heaven moved me and by it I come. Not for doing, but for not doing have I lost the sight of the high sun that you desire and that I knew too late. There is a place down there, not saddened by torments, but only by darkness, where the laments do not sound as shrieks, but are sighs. That's from the Purgatorio and the poem. What he did not do is cause for grief, an eternity of regret, one long dark night without relief. Time to brood, never to forget what he's missing, joy that might have been, the prize he wants but cannot get. It seems cruel, given that his sin is a mild one, considering all, his error being one of omission, unlike the one that caused the first fall, an act that brought creation to its knees, that grieves us and still appalls every living soul, made us unfree, kills us down to this day. Virgil was blind. He just couldn't see that God was God. He had no way to know the future. Gripped by the past, he walked in darkness. Here his sorrows lay, his place of undoing, his lot cast with blameless victims of a sad fate. The first of poets lives among the lost, cursed by knowledge that arrived too late. Wow, thank you, Angela. What a what a wonderful way to spend the summer, you know. I, so I just really um, think you've given us something here. And boy, there's some questions on uh, that were given to me in advance about Dante and Hell. 
a theology of hell, who is in hell, right? Things like that. What's the, what's the church's current take on hell? You know, for those who think about uh, Origen or Hans Urs von Balthasar or uh, even David Bentley Hart, someone like that, about this, these theories of an empty hell uh, after the radical gift, uh, the canonic gift of uh, redemption by uh, the living God of the Trinity. That gets very wonky theologically. But you bring us there, right? And you remind us that how art, and Randy as well, how art responds to art. Uh, Chekhov says uh, art may not uh, 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 what have the right uh, answers, but it knows how to frame the questions. And somehow I think in the, the poems and in, in the fiction, we're doing that. So thank you, Angela. A lot to think about there and such beautiful poetry uh, besides. We now give the, the floor over to our friend, Father Stephen Gregg. And Father Gregg has a, a meditation to share with us here. Thank you, Father Gregg. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. I, I wish I could offer something even remotely as interesting as what's already been shared. But uh, I liked the notion that there's a certain presumption we have that, <laughs> as readers of Dante, how dare I, how dare I uh, even try to imitate Dante, but I'll offer what I can. So the question ahead of us, and it's one I think about often, mainly as a student and teacher of Dante, why indeed does he matter? Uh, why choose this rather than the 100,000 other things that are interesting to do? Um, and well, you can already, you can know the tree by its fruit, right? So any, anyone listening now can hear from e even just the three artists on this panel that the Catholic tradition of imaginative work is, is incredibly alive. Uh, bearing great fruit. It's, it's not an easy group to belong to, you know, but it's got a lot of fruit that it's bearing and branching out in all kinds of directions, right? Not, and certainly not just in literature. So a clear case can be, can be made. I don't need to preach to the choir, right? A, a clear case can be made for, for needing to engage with this living and complex tradition. And if you're going to choose a starting place, Dante's work is simply the best, right? Though it's not scripture, and though it's not exactly part of theological tradition, nevertheless, it is the, the single best place, the most complete, and, and in a sense, we could say efficient. Like it, it, it doesn't, he doesn't waste any time in teaching you what you need. It's the best place to look for how the Catholic imagination works, you know, not, not only in literature, but in, in really all possible fields, it seems to me, is his ambition. And so that's just kind of a practical reason, you know, why, why Dante matters, but uh, a little more. So an, another reason I think Dante matters today for us, and we've hinted at it a little bit, but it's that he did not just write the Inferno and stop, right? He continued on through purgatory to paradise. I was thinking of it as we heard of, uh, of Mendelbaum's work of translating, sort of persevering, commenting on through, you know? You know, we all seem to have a feeling that these hundred or so years, the human race has been devoted to creating hell for itself. I'm thinking a little of the old question, can there be art after Auschwitz, right? Of course, yes, there can be. But alongside art's power to be testimony to pain and grief, to bear witness against injustice and evil, Dante shows us there's also this power of illumination. Reading the Divine Comedy opens our eyes to possibilities of grace and light and freedom, not just darkness, but grace and light and freedom, things that we are so prone to forget, even while Dante does face the full possibilities of existential darkness. I saw a small quote from uh, the famous old book by Paul Tillich uh, the other day. He wrote of Dante that his work enters the deepest places of human self-destruction and despair, as well as the highest places of courage and salvation. And the fact that Dante does both of those things, that's essential to why his work still matters. As an Aeneas, so let's go to his, his predecessor, more Virgil, right? As Aeneas finds out from the Sibyl in book six of Virgil's Aeneid, the way downward is easy. Black Dis's door stands open night and day. But to retrace your steps to heaven's air, there's the trouble. There is the toil. Now, Dante faces the, the darkness of hell. He sees the whole experience, and he's very thorough in his vision of it. 
but he nevertheless finds his way or rather is, is guided to the other side. And we need to learn to do this. We need to learn to share that experience as students and guides ourselves. Another way that he matters, on a smaller note, uh, in the monastery, uh, Dante matters in a special way. Uh, I have the, the, the privilege of being a, a Cistercian, a Cistercian monk. And we, what makes Dante matter is that he knows that the Cistercians are the best thing going in the kingdom of heaven. If you go through all of the other saints, they're all, they're all there in heaven. They all have great things to say. But at the very end, he gets to St. Bernard of Clairvaux, a matter of some spiritual pride in our monastery, right before the Virgin Mary, you know? So, you know, she, she wins in that sense. Um, Bernard takes over from Beatrice to direct Dante's eyes to the Blessed Virgin. Why does he choose Bernard? I think this, this tells us something about those who know about St. Bernard's writings in life. This tells us something about why Dante still is so alive, right? Why he can produce the fruits that we've been listening to. It's because this saint, I mean, yes, he had indeed thought everything through. He had a, a, a whole view of things like Dante, especially in his Marian writings. And he could express himself so eloquently that he is called the mellifluous doctor among all the doctors of the church. These are all important things for Dante. But most of all, St. Bernard insists, so, uh, as we learn it in the monastery, St. Bernard insists that the point of learning and the point of working, the point of prayer is not just more thinking or finding more ideas, but rather arriving to true experience of God's grace. And so Dante matters, like St. Bernard, I think, because he wants to use art to lead us to experience. We need the guide to real experience, rather than just art leading us to distraction or even just to instruction. Another way is maybe a last way, a last way from, from my point of view, uh, that uh, Dante matters today. I've, I've for years been struck by a word that he invented in Italian. And we don't really have an English word. We still haven't invent, invented a good English word for it. Um, there's a single neologism in the first canto of Paradise. It's hard to talk about heaven. And so Dante invents a lot of words in Paradise. But the word he creates is trasumanar, which is to, I guess in English, to transhumanize. It's... It, <laughs> which is not a good word. I wouldn't use it. It sounds so much better in Italian. It's translated usually to pass beyond the human or to soar beyond the human, right? To transcend the human. This is what Dante calls his journey. Though he says what this means cannot be put into words. And as he says, until grace grants you the experience to really know what Dante is writing about. It's sort of like really knowing what love is. You can talk about it all you want. Like, like I'm attempting to do right now. But the, the question is really, do you know love or not? Do you have the experience? This word he creates, trazumanar, is a powerful word. It's a, it's, it contains an idea that responds to a lot of our needs today, I think. So people speak a lot of living in a post-human world, right? Of passing beyond what usually have been considered the boundaries imposed by human nature, as if as if our human nature were a prison we were locked into from which we needed to escape. Nature itself, it seems like something we're trying to defy and to seek liberation from. I suppose there must be some good aspects to this, but it also, to me, honestly, sounds a little terrifying. <laughs> and Dante helps me. Dante is the true poet of, of passing beyond the human, quite literally, just <laughs> floats into outer space goes through this heavenly spheres. The poet of going not post-human, but he creates this word sort of transhumanic, uh, moving through the human into the heart of what it really means to be human by getting past the petty little self. The poetry of Dante, and I, I mean, a lot of the things we've heard today, even in this Zoom forum, these are works that have this metamorphic power, right? They show us the paradox that we most become who we are when we go beyond being just what we are. We go beyond being just ourselves. The sinners in hell, 
they're re- they're wretched in a lot of ways, but it's not mainly because of the tortures they undergo, right? Which are quite inventive and strange. It's not just the absence from God, which is of course eternally dismal and bad, but it's mainly because they are stuck being themselves forever, never capable of growing or advancing, slowly locked into the ice of lifelessness, like the image of uh, Satan at the bottom of hell, freezing himself into the waters, right? It's not God making him be there. It's just his being his own stupid self. Or the blasphemer in the seventh circle of hell named Kapaneus, this uh, figure from Greek mythology. He even makes a boast of this. He says, that which I was in life, I am in death. And he's proud never to be more than himself. So hell, you know, it's not like Sartre said, hell is not other people. (laughs) Heaven is other people. (laughs) Hell is you being nothing but you for all eternity, right? With no communion with the other. So it's an image that is profoundly effective for us, not only as creative artists, right? As teachers, as students, as monks, as, as priests, but just as, as people. Dante matters. We need this image of the right kind of human transformation to cure us from a lot of, like there's a lot of artificial and deceptive kinds of self-improvement, you know, that whole section of the bookstore, Dante's in the other section, (laughs) or alteration of self. And we need someone to lead us back to this true sense of what it really means to be free and human. So that's what I I find is just a longtime reader of Dante, somehow his work, which I I first read actually in Robert Pinsky's translation of the Inferno, uh, which is quite quite good. Uh, I don't think he ever went on to do the other two, um, but uh, it, it's it's a poetry that is capable of of freeing us to really be who we are, and that's I mean that's a challenge I, that I think we're all trying to live up to as as writers and teachers. So that's sort of my sense of why this man uh, matters seven hundred years later. So thank you. I've not heard such an eloqu- eloquent and uh, elegant penetrating catechesis on, I suppose, narcissism or something like that in a very, ever, ever. So you really distilled for us something important there to just to be stuck being yourself. That's that's something else. Uh, thank you very much, Father Greg, for that meditation. And last but not least, Randy, what'd you think of all that? And what do you have for us? Uh, well, I've decided to um, to put away my my planned remarks uh, to really very much respond to, to what I've, uh, what we've all heard from Paul, from Angela, from, from Father Stephen, your own reflections along the way, Mike. Um, and in the following way, you know, I think one of the experiences that everyone involved in this session has is that Dante finds you as much as you find Dante, you know, in unexpected ways throughout your life, whether as a teacher, uh, as a reader, just as an, as an ordinary person. Um, I've been reading Dante a canto a day for the past five years. And it started five years ago as a kind of almost spiritual practice, to be honest, every single day, one canto. Um, And it became something I started doing after vacuuming vacuuming potato chips out of the family car on a Saturday morning. I kid you not, in terms of where Dante finds you. I was listening to a BBC radio adaptation of the Divine Comedy. And I noticed heavy breathing in all seriousness. I'd never thought about this before that Dante and Virgil are working their way down through hell. It is a physically difficult journey, right? And so the actors were struggling. And I had this great idea immediately, someone should write a hiker's guide to Dante. There's lots of different companions all the way from the beginning, one of his sons wrote one. Someone should write a hiker's guide, a nice cute little book that you know millennials will buy. And so I had this idea that I would do this um, and very quickly started working with some undergraduates here at the University of Toronto on uh, a hiker's guide. Uh, but of course, you know, when you are a scheming novelist pretending to be an academic, something else happens. And so I very quickly realized that Dante was a way into writing uh, a trilogy of novels about what faith means in the modern world, the experience of faith for ordinary people in the modern world. And so my first one, original print came out a few years ago. It was in a sense an inferno novel 
And Dante's Indiana, from which I read to you earlier uh, this afternoon, is purgatory. Um, in terms of the premise of it, I've, I've already given you a sense of it. It's these, um, these people trying to build a Dante theme park, each one of whom uh, is lost, but also can serve as a guide for others. There's also someone concerned for others, trying to send help. In other words, one of the things that I realized from writing the novel is we make a category error by only seeing ourselves as Dante, never mind all the would-be sinners and saints in the, in the Divine Comedy. We should always already be open to being Virgil for others, to being Beatrice for others. And I think that gives you a sense of the fullness of response rather than only, am I Dante, yes or no, right? Um, you know, we all have a smack of Hamlet, whatever, but there's more to it than that, right? Um, and so how does that find me? It finds me with this novel, with this premise, these characters, each with their own struggles, um, are trying to build this theme park in this opioid ravaged small town. But here's the dilemma. Uh, the other, I think, significant original word, Father Stephen, in the Divine Comedy is contrapasso. Uh, and the, you know, the, uh, the logic of what you've done in this world kind of informing what you will do for eternity or make up for during eternity or be redeemed from during eternity. And so the premise of the novel is these characters are trying to build this theme park in a town where there's only one remaining uh, company. And that company is a plastics uh, manufacturing packaging company. And the people involved with this company have realized that the only way to keep people employed, to keep this town alive, is for this company to begin packaging opioids for local distribution. Why? Because it's the only thing that's a guaranteed business success in this small town. Now, if you're listening to that and you're thinking about a Dante theme park in the same town, um, you see that dilemma is a perfectly American dilemma in the 21st century, but it's also a dilemma that I can see as a novelist through Dante. Right? Dante provides a vision of ourselves and of the world around us, a sharpening, a clarity, a depth. So the novel that I've written um, is not by any means a kind of homage to Dante or a take on Dante. It's a novel about people living in the here and now where I'm only able to reveal things because of my reading, my reading the world around me through Dante, my writing about the world around me through Dante. And so, yeah, it's a theme park. There's a roller coaster named after Gary, and there's, there's lots of kind of fun Dante stuff in there. But really, it's seeing the struggles and the effort in the context of purgatory to move ahead uh, that really came through with this novel. I'll just say one final thing, and then I'll, I'll close. Um, Dante finding you where you, uh, where you wouldn't expect. Right before the pandemic, uh, my family, uh, my wife and I and our four daughters, we decided to get a dog. And so we had lots of debate about this and we ended up deciding to get a Weimaraner. Now, some of you may know a Weimaraner is a beautiful dog. It's a, you know, like a, basically a waist high German hunting dog and it's gray and it's sleek and it's beautiful. And we named our dog Virgil. Why? Because he is the companion through the middle of the journey of our lives. He's gray, a shade, and he doesn't go to heaven. And two weeks ago, Virgil died before he even turned two years old. Uh, he, cut, he had lymphoma. It was a very quick and completely unexpected experience. And, you know, we've all been trying to make sense of it in so many different ways. As you can imagine, we'll probably get another puppy eventually. But then if you think about the greatest, from, to my mind, the great heartbreak moment in the poem is Virgil's disappearance, right? When Dante just turns and he's gone. And if you think as a writer or as a reader or as someone who's lost a beloved family pet of just how demanding that decision was for Dante, given how important Virgil was for him to not create the conditions for an elaborate goodbye. Why? Because there's something important here, something more important. It's continuing the journey. It's going on towards God. And I think if that's one thing that Dante can tell us as readers, as writers, as, as dog lovers, uh, that's why he matters today. Thank you. Well, and every, the, the Zoom screens are clapping and, and really giving kind of proper uh, response and respect and adulation to this great panel. I, I'm so nourished by all these insights. I know our, our, our uh, viewers, I suppose, are as well. 
I had a lot of questions in advance. I have some in my chat now. I want to be able to work in some voices here. Uh, Brian Volk uh, really came on on the, the heels of Contrapasso, Randy, and others. Uh, and Brian writes this, can someone speak to the current relevance of Dante's use of Contrapasso, in which the punishment for, uh, for the sin is the sin itself? Uh, the terrifying uh, reality of hell is, as Father Greg says, is getting the lesser good you choose rather than God's goodness and to be stuck there forever. Uh, anybody on our panel comment on the creativity? Is in, in, uh, Here's another question. Is Don, some people say Dante's vindictive about his Florentine colleagues that have forgotten him and treated him so poorly. So what do you think about these, these hellish landscapes and contrapasso? Uh, anybody? Can I just can I just respond yeah. right away? Yeah, yeah. And, and hi, Brian. It's good to good to hear a question from you. Uh, very quickly, uh, an American Midwestern Rust Belt town that has destroyed itself with opioid addiction, and then staying alive by packaging opioids for local distribution, seems to me an example of you know an American contrapasso. Uh, the professors who work at this Dante theme park are all failed academics, and they're all Dante scholars who couldn't get jobs. And so, what is their kind of condemnation. They have to take all of their years of learning and devote it to creating a theme park that goes completely against everything that they believe in as academics. But it's the only way, again, to keep going, to keep providing. So I, I think the concept of contrapasso opens up so much about, about life today um, and you know the kind of the high stakes consequences of ordinary living in so many ways, right? Um, and then the, the, the goal is to get beyond the contrapasso, to get, to get more towards, um, I won't even try it in the Italian, but, you know, the, the moment, the transu, what have you. Transu Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how to get from one to the other as readers, as individuals, and even as, as writers, right? It's easier to write about Inferno. It's harder to write about Purgatory. It's very hard, I think, to write about Paradiso, to get beyond contrapasso. We have a nice pairing emerging with uh, Trazumanar and Contrapasso as conceptual. Anybody else want to respond? Uh, yeah, I would like to. Um, one of the, th the things that I think we need to credit Dante with, with his concept of Contrapasso, is he is so a brilliant psychologist. He understands the nature of human nature. And uh, as we were talking about earlier, you know, those creatures, those people, barely recognizable as people in hell. Uh, what makes their torture so awful is that they are damned to be continually themselves and be trapped in the sin that they love uh, and their besetting sin for the rest of eternity uh, because they cannot see the world other than the way that they've always seen it and do things that way. But one of my favorite contrapasso moments in literature, there are many, uh, is in Flannery O'Connor and many people I know in the audience uh, are Flannery O'Connor fans great Catholic writer who says, for my money, there's nobody as good as Dante. This is Flannery's brilliant uh, formulation on Dante. Uh, but, you know, at the end of her story, Revelation, uh, where this terribly racist woman, uh, and not only is she a racist, she is a classist. She doesn't like poor people. She doesn't like people who uh, have mental illness. Uh, she thinks all these people are lesser than she is. Uh, and, and God gives her, she, she, she's angry at God. Uh, because God sort of calls her out on this through this, this experience that she has. And she's very angry at God. And she basically asks God, who do you think you are? And God gifts her with a vision, uh, a, a purgatorial vision in which all of these souls are rumbling up towards heaven, towards God, in the same way that Dante is heading up towards heaven. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, all those people that she can't stand are at the head of the line. They're first. And she and her husband, who they, she thinks, of course, are the best people in the world, are at the last. Um, and of course, this is this is this character's Mrs. Turpin's image of you know of you know the 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 way that uh, that salvation is going to look. Uh, this kind of eschatological vision that she has, and it's perfectly suited to her because she can only see the world in terms of rank and in terms of discriminatory characters, uh, uh, categories that people hold. Uh, and therefore the vision is perfect for her uh, because this is the way in which she understands the world. Uh, and so O'Connor is brilliant uh, in borrowing from Dante uh, in, in, in uh, psychologically brilliant in giving us, yes, this is the vision that a Mrs. Turpin would have. Um, so, you know, the contrapasso is just something that is so thoroughgoing and so very useful. Um, and in terms, I was even talking with my students about this today, you know, if 
let's make a new inferno. Let's make a new purgatorio. Where are we going to put Andrew Cuomo? We're from New York. Where, where are we going to put um, you know, Donald Trump? Where are we going to put Joe Biden? Uh, and what are they going to be doing? What is their particular besetting sin? And what will they be doing for eternity? Um, Dante just makes us think about stuff like that, which is great. <laughs> Uh, that's great, uh, Angela. That's wonderful. Um, you know, Stephen, uh, you know, Father Stephen and Paul, you can uh, ring in, but I don't want to maybe integrate a question because there's one from Monica Fryer, and she says she's been she's just begun reading The Inferno by, at a translation by Kieran Carson, and she says it seems to have some funny elements in it. <laughs> Do you think Dante? The, the question cuts off. I think. Uh, is Dante trying to be funny? Uh, where's humor in Contrapasso? Is there humor in Contrapasso? What about humor in Dante? Anybody? Yeah, have a, yeah Steve. My, my, uh, yeah, my, my, my students are always wondering why is it called a comedy when it seems mostly so dreary? Uh, and I say, well, you have, you have to be able to find th there's a certain kind of humor. So I think you're right that it's in the, the Contrapasso in a way, right? There's a, um, so to continue on this idea, like Contrapasso is a matter of justice. You 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 get what you gave we could say you know the the tyrants are boiled in a river of blood i mean so you sort of are in your own territory but it's it's also a matter of wisdom uh god knows the way because it's not just inferno i mean we purgatorio more really than inferno the ways that you are punished correspond to what you really need to help you grow right um and strangely it's it's a manifestation also i i think of of divine love like god will let you be where you want to be <laughs> this is uh he loves your freedom and it, but it does lead to funny moments i mean uh it's that's it, what's wonderful about the inferno like there are some things that are either really horrifyingly scary or funny like a lot of horror movies are like that too right if you're in the right mood the horror movie becomes hilarious uh so i think of that example I mentioned of the tyrants boiling in blood. Well, we hear that some of them are boiling up to their head, but some are, it's only boiling their feet, which suddenly calls to mind the image of Attila the Hun dancing to keep his feet out of the water or something. You know, there's this implied, like, how do they react? Dante doesn't tell you, but you can, and he tells us the centaurs are guarding to make sure they don't move away from their place. So they're all like trying to steal bases, basically. Um, you think, you know, that's actually a kind of a funny image if I get into it or, um, you know, there's other parts of the lower part of hell. Strangely, the further you go in hell, like the eighth circle is sort of the funniest uh, weird things going on. Um, so I think there is a humor, but I don't know that Dante very often like highlights it, you know? Because um, once you highlight the humor, it's hard to also communicate the serious lesson. So, um, yeah, it's a challenge that he masters. But uh, I feel like, you know, modern health, like, I don't know, the Arby's coupon somehow more immediately funny to me, right? Uh, there's there, we, we, need to, uh, we need to have the humor closer, I think, than Dante maybe his audience did. Yeah, that's well put. We need, the humor needs to be closer. That really is it. Uh, Paul Mariani, uh, you, you've come off my screen. Are you still on the call, Paul? I think Patty or Adam. I think we need to re we need to reconnect with Paul Mariani somehow. Uh, hopefully, because Paul has a poem for us as we, we close. We're going to shoot to close at at five thirty five. Um, so let me just uh, read to you a, a couple more questions, and you can respond. Uh, Jessica Hooten Wilson, uh, our great colleague uh, from the Catholic Imagination Conference and other places, Jessica is a great reader and writer. She would, she's asking what what's the best resource for first time Dante readers who are confused by any number of things in the poem. I'll Randy, say very quickly. I, sure. I suspect Father Stephen and Angela have more um, more specific request suggestions. Just read it, <laughs> embrace the confusion, just fall into it. And then later there's tons of commentaries that are, I think the Hollander, the, Holl the, com the Hollander combination is superb, for example, but I would just say, just start reading it and accept that you're gonna be kind of overwhelmed in good ways and, and then kind of go from there. Um, I just happen to have this little book by my side. It's called To Hell and Back, a, re a Modern Reader's Guide 
Um, and it's not by a, a great scholar. It's actually by a diocesan priest from Baltimore named Joseph Gallagher. It's published by Triumph Books. And it's really a lovely, I've had this book for many years when I used to live in Baltimore. And I go back to it all the time because he does a really nice job of just summarizing what happens in each canto. Uh, so for particularly for a student who's encountering it for the first time and is wondering like just exactly what is going on. And he just does a really nice job of, of, of uh, summarizing it. So Jessica, this is, this is a good one. <laughs> There's lots of others out there too, but this is one that I rely on all the time. Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, it is a, a question of how many notes to, <laughs> to use. Uh, I, I think Randy's right. I mean, the, the main goal with any poetry is even, you know, like, like trying to learn a foreign language, just read it all first, then go look up the words. Right. Dante has so many references that a student who gets obsessed with finding out every little detail will never finish. So the uh, like the Hollander volumes are they're the greatest to just have around you. The translation is wonderful. Robert and Jean Hollander. But every canto has there's an outline. Oh, sorry. There's a, a bell ringing. That's <laughs> I mean, that means adoration is starting soon. Excellent. Uh, sorry. So anyway, uh, the Hollander one has 10 to 15 pages of notes for every canto. This is too much for most people, but anything you want to know, and most of those notes can also be found at, at online. So the Dartmouth Dante Lab has a great website with all kinds of commentary. Um, I also like... Uh, so Anthony Esselin has a, a relatively new translation from the modern library whose notes are just the right level. Like there's just enough notes, <laughs> uh, mostly on biblical and philosophical connections and has a good outline, a good like summary of each canto. Um, the, other, the other resource that's helpful for students working to get more in depth in a single canto. So the digital Dante at Columbia University, they have, a, it's, I mean, the commentary is extremely uh, detailed and interesting. So it's a little bit much for just, you know, the average reader, but it is true that the, the first thing to do is just read through the whole canto. Every, each canto is only 130 something lines long. So you can do it in, in not even 10 minutes. Um, and then if you need go to the notes, but there's always going to be something that will catch you there. Um, and I just want to emphasize the digital Dante is brilliant and it's great for students because it's entirely online and you can just click on any canto from the purgatory you want and click on any commentary on it and then you can actually watch an hour long lecture by Teodolina Bartolino, Bartolini, the great Dante scholar. Um, so it's really, uh, it, it's got everything in one site. It's great for students. Thank you all. Paul Mariani, I hear you're back on the call, which is uh, just, it's music to my ears. Who do you like for uh, translations of Dante uh, or helps in introducing people to Dante who are not exactly scholars? Okay, maybe there's a little, another gap. We'll get Paul, we will. Um, could I, mention, could I mention one tiny thing also? Sure. So uh, just starting yesterday, we opened a, a website mainly through Baylor University here in Texas, but also the University of Dallas called 100 Days of Dante. So from, from this week until next Easter, they're releasing six to seven minute videos on one canto at a time, three cantos a week. So if you start reading this week, you can finish the entire thing by Easter of next year. So that's a website to check out. They're professors from, from uh, Gonzaga and Baylor and UD and various other places. So you can find that too. That's great to hear. Thanks, Father Stephen. Last question, then we'll see what, where we are. Angela, you might, we might queue up first, Angela, and change the order with the poetry reading. But the last question I think is a good one from Marian Wernicke. And she says, do I detect Dante in Eliot's The Wasteland? What do we think, panel? Uh, absolutely. In many ways, I think the, Don, uh, the, the Wasteland would not have been written uh, if it weren't for Dante. Um, as, uh, you know, he loves this idea of, of the dead. People who, you know, as you know, the opening uh, lines of the Wasteland are the burial of the dead, uh, in which he quotes from Dante about the, the crowds going over London Bridge. And he says, I had not thought death had undone so many. There are all these people who are the walking dead, basically, like somnambulants, what, you know, wandering through life who aren't really alive. 
Uh, and then, of course, there are voices that actually come from the, the, uh, the inferno that speak in the poem. Um, so um, uh, Eliot's whole conception of the poem really is based on this idea of descending into hell, the hell of modern life, the horrible wasteland landscape, and reporting what it is he sees and then listening to what others say. Uh, in one of the subtitles, the actual original title of uh, the Wasteland was He Do the Police in Different Voices, which actually comes from a Dickens novel. Um, and this is what this poem is all about, and, and channeling all of these voices that Dante channels. There are over 500 characters uh, in, the, uh, in the, the Commedia, um, not quite so many in the Wasteland. It used to be longer before Ezra Pound cut it down. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it really is very much in the spirit of Dante. And, and we owe, you know, we owe so many great modern works of literature and ones from the past to Dante. Thank you, Angela. Very insightful and very helpful. Uh, uh, anybody else to, to, uh, to answer on that question before we close? Okay, thanks very much for that. Thanks for the question too, Marion. Um, I think we have Paul. We may have to unmute him. Patty, can you unmute him from your side? Okay, we'll work on that. And then we will ask uh, Angela, if you would, uh, to uh, please read uh, how we framed it. We've asked uh, Angela to read a selected poem as a closing, one of our closing uh, motions here. So Angela, please. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, strikes me about this question, you know, what, what is important about Dante now um, to us, why does he matter in this moment, you know, September of 2021 is, uh, you know, we've been through hell, right? This last year and a half has been hellish, uh, especially for those of us who lived in New York City, uh, where we, you know, were the epicenter of the virus. Uh, I can't think of a worse hellscape than Manhattan with its constant blaring sirens and Queens, uh, where the body, uh, the refrigerated trucks were outside of Elmhurst Hospital filling up with bodies. Uh, and the Bronx, where I work, uh, where they came in with earth movers and were digging graves on Hart Island because we didn't have enough space to bury people. Um, it was, as they say, like something out of Dante here uh, for, um, for a, a good long time. Uh, and so I think we recognize the, what Dante has to teach us about uh, extremity um, and, the suff and suffering and the hope for redemptive suffering, which is, of course, what, um, uh, what uh, Dante is all about and what the Comedia is all about. Um, so I didn't even realize it, but when I wrote my, it, my, it won't allow oops, no, call, call, uh, the, the, the book that I just recently published called Love in the Time of Coronavirus, I wasn't consciously thinking of Dante, but I realized it. Are you back? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah, hear we you, Paul. We've got Paul back. You, I, am I back? Paul, you are back, and oh. it's so good to see you again, my friend. Oh, I'm sorry, Murph. No worries. We're, we're all good, Paul. We're going to just uh, settle in. Angela's about to read a poem. Then we're, we're going to go to you. Okay. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. So this, uh, this, the, the shape of this book owes everything to Dante, and I didn't even realize it uh, because it really begins in this state of um, disarray uh, and this sense of, um, you know, the dark wood uh, that we were all walking through, only in this case, the wood is on fire. And basically the book goes on this step-by-step -step journey through hell, through inferno, through purgatorio and aspiring towards paradise. Um, so I'm just gonna read um, the first sonnet and the last because the first sonnet is, you know, the dark wood, the hell, and then the last one is the aspiration towards paradise. Um, so the first poem is called The Fire. The world is burning and we don't have a clue how the fire started when or where or who lit the match and held it to the kindling trees, watched the blaze blossom, set fire to the bees who were too busy being to feel the heat rising around them, devouring the flowers. It took years, not months or weeks or hours to lay it all to waste. Every city and street is a ghost town now. We haunt our own dreams. The world as it used to be only seems impossibly green, sweet, blue, and true, like a photo you took once, and now you study to find yourself, trying to lay claim to love before it went up in flames. 
and then I'll just close with this last poem, which is obviously a prayer and an aspiration towards paradise. Again, a sonnet, it's called Pandemic Prayer. Bless the day that dawns on us, we're all in need of light. Bless the birds that flit and fuss, they've been asleep all night. Bless the cats who wear no masks, slinking through the yard. Bless the simple daily tasks that have become so hard to do without. The fire pits blaze, the meals I make with joy, the windows that I wash and raise. The virus can't destroy this urge to bless our life and praise even these pandemic days. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Just singular responses and just high, high attention, I think. COVID, seems like COVID puts you in a space. You're always in a space, but it seems to put you in a different one of real listening. So thank you very much for that and for sharing the poetry. Uh, Paul Mariani, welcome back. You thank have, you. You've decided so, on a poem of your own for today as well. Um, please proceed. Yes. It's called A Paraplum of Poets, and it's in Tertsarima. Then turning back from the dark, I saw a light come toward me. And as it drew nearer, I made out a face I knew I knew, though the man had long since gone. Still, I could see it was him. Alan, dear friend, I said, how good to see you here now even in this darkness. You, who brought light to so many in your time, your Dante, your Ovid, your Virgil too, among the voices your gift with words restored to life. You, above so many other guides, showed me the way to better understand my poets with their inner strife and reconciliations flaring out before they settled on the page. And here I am, trapped, once again, these decades on, the sands in my own hourglass nearly gone, dear sage. And this, the final journey to learn and lean upon those poets I spent so many years searching for a reality in those precious scraps they left, then is now drawn to their words for what light they might offer me. He nodded then to say he understood. Wasn't he here now to guide me to those who'd helped me see and be? Yes, I was your mentor, he smiled. Though it was clear our paths would each go their way. And there would be a time when another's words would call me here, you there, me to Judy Chi and on to Florentine's Commedia, and the one who sang of Rome, then Ovid's metamorphoses and my own helmaxiums. Call it a lifetime's encyclopedia, as with pounds shape shifting cantos, so I might seize the souls of genius for those coming after, like yourself. And you, Bubula, nursed on the patois of Patterson, it seems clear now how your own beloved poets filled your shelf with the antagonistic cooperation that resonates and defines you, gleaned from that Jersey doctor. Then too, that sense of self discovered in the inscapes of your Jesuit, whose lines captured the role, the rise, the carol, the creation of a world rising from blue bleak embers and shines here now, even in the dark, to lift the imagination and offer you its consolation for the asking. Praise him, praise this poet priest restored to light, his heroic resignation following his master. It took 30 years to raise him up and in time lead you through your own uncertain years. Not so fast, the one who let nothing ever face him interrupted. It was Huffy Henry, with his brilliant wit, but tears too for this bearded, edgy man who suffered loss after loss as he downed a whiskey, then another and another, whose fears of losing a father, two wives and himself were there, 
the costs of love and fame that led to lockdown and finally suicide. Call me the lost saint of purgatory who double crossed myself one too many times and joked about it until the tide went out and with it my clipped final song as I stared down from that gelid bridge having hit the booze again. And so I died waving adieu like my dear heart crane as I too hurled down a noun splitting from the words which give it meaning to float off into some abyss and yet still hoping somehow to be found again. But in those addresses to the Lord, I said, you vote for something more than Henry ever hoped for. How many times you replayed Hamlet's play within a play conniving to quote those words to make mother fess up to daddy's death, the crimes, the times. Still in the end, it was you there dead upon that floor and not her or the man whose name you bore that rhymes with bury man as if all was foreordained. And now the long war over, except he said, for my words, which might still give you and others hope. Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that could be said, uh, but Paul, I would ask you maybe, because we hear this menagerie of living voices, your great heroes, people you've written about, John Berryman, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Alan Mandelbaum, and this original work, uh, what move, I mean, it's, it's, I don't want to say what, 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 what through your mind as you wrote, but this, it, it's, it's a text without comment, but is there anything you'd like to say as, a, as an afterpiece in the composition of this wonderful, uh, just part of the poem you've written? Yes, Mike, uh, this was my way of, you know, a lifetime spent as a biographer, 40 years of it, right? And this was my chance to bring my own guide, just as Dante brought Virgil, for me to bring Alan and to see each of these men, each of these poets, and to let them speak for themselves before I, find, I said my final goodbye to them. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Well, it's time for us to say a final goodbye, but we leave the last word for Dante. So Father Greg, if you would. Yeah, uh, I have the privilege of just reading, not my own work, but just Dante. <laughs> um, this is, we began with the um, entry into the gates of hell and we'll conclude with the entry into the celestial rose of the saints in heaven. So this is Canto 31 of Paradiso, the, the first, first line, the first 40 lines of it. In forma dunque di candida rosa, mi si mostrava la milizia santa che nel suo sangue Cristo fece sposa. Ma l'altra che volando vede e canta la gloria di colui che la namora e la bontà che la fece cotanta, si sì come schiera d'ape che s'infiora una fiata e una si ritorna là dove suo lavoro s'insapora. Nel gran fior discendeva che s'adorna di tante foglie e quindi risaliva là dove il suo amor sempre soggiorna. Le facce tutte avean di fiamma viva e l'ali d'oro e l'altro tanto bianco che nulla neve a quel termine arriva. Quando scendea nel fior di banco in banco porgevan della pace e dell'ardore che li acquistavan ventilando il fianco. Nell'interporsi tra il di sopra e il fiore di tanta moltitudine volante impediva la vista e lo splendore che la luce divina è penetrante per l'universo secondo che degno, sì che nulla le puote essere ostante. Questo sicuro e gaudioso regno, frequente in gente antica e in novella, viso e amore avea tutto ad un segno. O trina luce! 
che n'unica stella scintillando a lor vista si li appaga. Guarda qua giù so alla nostra procella. Se i barbari, venendo da tal plaga che ciascun giorno delice si copra, rotante col suo figlio nella e vaga, veggendo Roma e l'ardua sua opra, stupefaciensi quando laterano alle cose mortali ando di sopra, io che al divino dall'umano, all'eterno dal tempo era venuto, e di Fiorenza in popol giusto e sano, di che stupor dove essere compiuto. Certo tra esso e il Gaudio mi facea libito non udire e starmi muto. I think there's the English now. Is it Randy then Paul or? Yeah, thank you. After that beautiful rendering though, yeah. a mere Canadian accented English is going to be quite a come down everybody. So from Paradiso to the purgatory of listening to me read it in English. So in the shape of that white rose, the Holy Legion was shown to me. The host that Christ with his own blood had taken as his bride. The other host which flying sees and sings the glory of the one who draws its love and that goodness which granted it such glory, just like a swarm of bees that at one moment enters the flowers and at another turns back to that labor which yields such sweet savor, descended into that vast flower graced with many petals, then again rose up to the eternal dwelling of its love. Their faces were all living flame, their wings were gold, and for the rest, their white was so intense, no snow can match the white they showed. When they climbed down into that flowering rose, from rank to rank, they shared that peace and ardor which they had gained with wings that fanned their sides. Nor did so vast a throng in flight, although it interposed between the candid rose and light above, obstruct the sight or splendor. Because the light of God so penetrates the universe according to the worth of every part that no thing can impede it. This confident and joyous kingdom, thronged with people of both new and ancient times, turned all its sight and order to one mark. O oh, threefold light, that in a single star sparkling into their eyes contents them so. Look down and see our tempest here below. If the barbarians, when they came from a region that is covered every day by Hellas, who wheels with her loved son, were seeing Rome in her vast works, struck dumb when of all mortal things, the Lateran was the most eminent, then what amazement must have filled me when I through the divine came from the human to eternity from time and to a people just and sane from Florence came. And certainly between the wonder and the joy, it must have been welcome to me to hear and speak nothing. Excelsior, my dear friends, and may our loving God bless our day and keep the Dante year and keep all of our graces going. Thank you all panelists for your wisdom and insight, your creativity and your imagination. So thank you viewers for making the time. We hope to see you again very soon on a Hank Center event or indeed, please check out the Curran Center at Fordham. Lots of wonderful things happening there. Yeah. Well, and that's it, my friends. Thanks for staying on a bit longer than usual, but I tell you, it was worth it. And that was self-evident. Peace be with you. Thank you. Ciao, everybody. Good afternoon. Good night, everybody. <laughs>